I'm good. How about you? Good. Um, I'm glad to be here with you. I um, got connected to Mitchell uh, a few months ago, and I was actually about to head to a music festival and realizing that I am guilty of never, I've never tested my drugs, and that was kind of the catalyst. I, I told the I, audience. Well, yeah, I am. Um, And I know you do more than that. And I definitely want to, you know, hear all about what you you do. Um, But yeah, it just made me realize, you know, I I heard you speaking in another interview about, you know, everyone saying like, oh, their plugs the best. And um, we have trust in who we some people, but I do have trust in who I source my substances from. And but they aren't the ones to do the testing. They claim that the person before them does the testing. And um, everyone I, you know, I started asking my friends and it's like nobody tests their own stuff and it just seems like a huge red flag to me. Um, and so, yeah, and I started, I poked our team and of course my whole team, they all test their, um, they've been doing this for a while and they, you know, sent me to dance safe and I was like, I, I want to learn more about this because I, I checked out the site and specifically when it came to testing, I was like, oh my goodness, this is like a lot, it looks more complicated than I think I thought it would be. Um, so anyway, I, I, that's kind of why you're here. I really wanted to bring someone from your team on to just talk more about your work. And um, yeah, why don't we start there if you want to like, introduce yourself and then share more about Dance Save for our audience who might not know who you are. Sure. Yeah. So I'm Rachel. I use she, her pronouns. I'm Dance Safe's education manager, which means that I am involved to some capacity in pretty much everything that we put out that has an educational flavor to it, including drug checking materials, um, all the content on our website, all of our social media, all of the printed materials at the booth, any outreach things that we do. Um, Most recently, I just refreshed the entire Dance Safe volunteer training with the help of the team. So the new training is currently live at dancesafe.org slash volunteer. And I, I strongly recommend checking it out because that is a whole upgrade from where we were before. And Dance Safe itself is a 501c3 public health nonprofit that is probably best known for testing your drugs in the nightlife settings. But we have we do all kinds of other stuff. We're health and safety overall, pursuit of fulfillment, bodily autonomy, cognitive liberty, things like that. So um, we do things ranging from drug education to drug checking tools to our We Love Consent program, which is super amazing, um, to things around like heat stroke and hydration and um, condoms, earplugs, all the basics to make sure that you have fun, don't die, don't throw up on yourself. And if you do, that you don't die because you threw up on yourself. (laughs) Amazing. Well, not amazing. I hope that doesn't happen, but it's amazing that you you guys are, are covering all the bases. When I was exploring your site, you know, I think at least within the industry and my own perceptions was like, oh, drug testing. But I did see, um, you know, additional harm reduction relating to music and festivals. And um, that's really cool and really awesome just to see that you're out there doing that work. Uh, but I'm curious, you specifically, how did you get into this work? Do you have like a personal, you know, drug story? <laughs> Oh yeah. I mean, I love I love getting asked this question in interviews because my answer is always the same, which is that I love drugs. And I found Arrowwood for anyone that's ever heard me say this spiel before, I'm sorry, but um I found Arrowwood when I was 13 and I was just like totally ravenous for it. I read all of the experience vaults that I could. I would sit up listening to One Republic on a folding table in my living room and just like read everything that I could. And I was so, I was like, this is it. Like, this is it. And, um, I had my own whole experience moving through all different kinds of involvement and doing drugs and, you know, moving drugs and whatever, things like that. And, um, all kinds of other th- stuff that mostly went down while I was in high school, actually, that I'm still deciding if I want to share on public platforms yet. Um, probably will at some point because there are some really interesting stories in there, like buying an eight ball of meth alone when I was 16 from a bunch of 35 year olds that were packing in a parking lot. And that was when I got my first dance safe kit. Um, my dad bought me a dance safe kit. And so that was, I knew about dance safe when I was like 15, 16 and I was in my school computer lab looking up everything I could about drugs and no one would answer me. I would message the dance safe website, never got a response. And then got into the underground rave scene when I was 16 or 17 and um, had already been in the burner community for a little bit and 
Then I ended up meeting the LA Dancy folks and would hang out around the booth and then started volunteering behind the booth at Lightning in a Bottle when I was 18. And it's really just a snowball from there. Like the more people you meet, the more invested you are. Started teaching a class about drugs as part of an experimental student taught um, program at my college, things like that. So um, I went from volunteer to unpaid intern to paid intern to contractor to staff member, basically the whole nine yards over the course of about 10 years. That's incredible. Um, I'm curious if you're open to sharing what um, what drugs were you experimenting with, like all sorts of drugs from a young oh, yeah. age? Yeah, just everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I um, – my range – I have limited experience with opioids. That is a class that I do not have as much experience with. I'm not opposed to it. It just hasn't been like in my vicinity as much. Um, I have a lot of experience in communities that use opioids. And personally, I had a bit of a research chemical phase when I was 17. I ended up having a a suspected stroke on 4-fluoramphetamine when I was 17. And in addition to that, um, I've been around the block with a lot of the novel substances that have hit the market. So things like um, MXE and 3-MeO-PCE and um, other stuff that's a little bit more off the beaten track. I'll try anything three times, you know? Um, but other than that, I'm a really big fan of cocktails. I like stacking small amounts of a lot of different things. I like being augmented, not altered. So that's kind of my specialty now at this point in my life is like small quantities of a bunch of stuff. Cool. Yeah. I, I think what's so great about being informed about drugs is, and it's not just informed about the substance, it's the the substance, how it interacts with you, you know, and really it's a fun experiment. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you can really learn what, like you might go too far one time, but then you kind of learn, you know, it really is a learning experience. Yep. So I, I'm a big believer. I mean, I started in the cannabis space and in terms of like career wise and also just uh, medical like benefit wise. Um, I was in a really serious car accident, actually was leaving lightning in a bottle, um, 2016. Um, it was actually seven years ago today, which is wild. It's Memorial day. Cause we just have a, yeah, it's LIB weekend. Um, oh, what a nice blast from the past. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, it, it's, it's actually pretty incredible because I was on lots of opioids and nerve meds and I just, you know, even pharma, uh, you know, has such stigma to it as well on the, you know, on the flip side, but you know, pharmaceutical medication saved my life, like literally would not be alive. And I also would be hooked on opioids probably if it were not for cannabis. (laughs) Uh, So, and for, so I think it's, you know, East meets West. We have so much knowledge and information. Like it's like, can't we just put our hands together? (laughs) Um, (laughs) But yeah, I I found, you know, through experimenting with, with cannabis um, and really learning my dose and, uh, you know, that that's all that I really am a big believer in just like try it, you know, you start small and um, and see how you feel and no one's going to really tell you what's the right amount for you. Um, but just because we we're talking about lightning in a bottle, I'm curious. I mean, I know that's not all you do, but I would love to talk a little bit about, you know, Dance Safe's work at music festivals. And um, I'm really curious for the drug testing specifically, like, what do you guys typically find, you know, at a festival, someone, people come, do they, are they really showing up to show their, you know, to test their drugs and are, what what is like a common findings there? So, um, there are a few parts to this question as always, nothing is simple. We know nothing. Um, the first part is that we are, our testing services are extremely highly utilized. Um, and they always have been. There's a reason that they're so popular. It's because it represents a kind of like secret sneaky, like, ooh, you can go get your drugs, your drugs tested here. Like, oh my God, that's how, wow, wow. And the second part is that DanceSafe has been around for 25 years, a quarter century. And um, this has been a guerrilla effort since the beginning in a lot of ways. And because of that, we are in a position as an org of kind of constantly backtracking and trying to implement very basic foundational structures that were just not there when we had literally zero collateral. So um, our ability to kind of like track and record (laughs) the drug checking results that we get at festivals has been super sporadic, very limited, often based on what chapters specifically will provide in that moment. So that's a project that I'm currently working on right now is trying to figure out how to really 
um, get a better centralized database of the drug checking results that we see. Like there are a few efforts underway there. From uh, my personal exposures to, I spend a lot of time in outreach. I used to spend more time in outreach, but I am very looped into the findings of outreach. Um, I do a lot of, of training within the org of how to use drug checking materials and just recently rolled out a whole new way of doing it that's going to be implemented this summer. Um, usually what we see at festivals is not only very regionally indicated, but also will be a little bit different depending on the specific genre and vibe of the event. So like a speedway festival that has more hip hop artists is going to have a different set of drugs than a camping festival that has a bunch of wooks. Like that's just how it's going to be, right? Different demographics, like different substances. So depending on where we're located, the drug trends are going to be different. I would say, um, with the amount of information that we can get from reagents is really limited. So reagents being the corrosive chemicals that are predominantly used in at-home drug checking. People really want, I think, to have more certainty from their reagent results than they can actually get. So the way that I teach people to use them is that you're looking for red flags and not green lights. You're not looking for confirmation that something is in your substance. You're looking for a red flag about whether something is obviously or potentially not what you expected. So historically, dance safe volunteers might have been like, oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. And that's language that we're really working on phasing out because it's not completely accurate. And these are things that we learn as we go. And this is all a lot of jumbled backstory as to why basically the information that I can tell you is coming from myself. Part of my job within dance safe is tracking drug trends around the country and the world. So when I look at the results of a reagent test, Volunteers, I only want them to say whether something is reacting as expected or not for the substance someone thinks they have. When I look at it, because I have a more robust understanding of the, the different substances on the market, I might be able to give a little bit more information than that. So for instance, if someone comes into the booth and they have like a crystal and they're like, this was sold to me as MDMA, and we test it with Marquis reagent and it turns black and we test it with Simon's reagent and it turns blue and it's like a rock. The likelihood that there are other things in this rock is fairly low, and the likelihood that the active ingredient in the rock is MDMA is fairly high. Is it confirmed? No. It could be some analog we've never seen before that happens to react the exact same way in reagents. and Or someone could have put in the effort to be like Evil Knievel and re-rock it. Like, I, I don't know why they would do that, but they could have, theoretically. So there are a lot of unknowns. Typically, the substances that people bring by the booth are almost always going to be MDMA, MDA, ketamine, um, cocaine, LSD. And that's like the, the big five, really, is those are the ones that people want to test at festivals most of the time. But then we also get people who want to test their G, which we can't do, um, who want to test their shrooms, which we can't do, who want to test their weed, which we can't do, um, who want to test their most likely counterfeit benzos, which we also can't do. So there are limitations there. I would say that on average from the FTIR data that we've collected, because we've, we have um, Fourier transformation, like um, I don't want to butcher the name of it. I should really know what the acronym says. Um, it's a more advanced kind of drug checking that we can bring out sometimes to festivals. Um, that data, we're doing a better job of actually inputting the FTIR techs that work for Dan Safe are fucking amazing. They are so good. And so we're trying to get more data visualizations from those results Typically, what I would say as a conglomerate of what I've witnessed from being on site at events is that about 20% of the reagent tests we do do not react as expected. And that's also messy because sometimes something might react as expected and it isn't actually what someone thought it was. Like, that's why we're not looking for green lights. We're looking for red flags. Um, we've had cases of people bringing in a rock that some guy sold them for 80 bucks a G at the porta potty and it's just Epsom salts. We've had someone come in who was like, I bought Quaaludes and I'm super drunk and I just took them and I'm freaking out. And so we tested with FTIR and it's actually Soma, which is a muscle relaxant. Um, not nearly as high risk as Quaaludes in that situation. Um, plenty of counterfeit bars. It's super common for people to have counterfeit um, Xanax that actually contains like clonazolam or fluoprazolam or flubromazolam or bromazolam or otizolam or whatever. Um, and it is, I would say, if people do bring in oxys, if it ain't from a script, it ain't legit, it's almost always going to contain fentanyl in my experience. Like you should assume that any oxy that's not from a script contains fentanyl. Um, and then you get into things like 
okay, someone was sold GHB, but it's actually GBL or 1,4-B, so the dosing is different. You have to dilute it in citric acid or citrus or water or whatever. Um, it might dissolve the plastic it comes in. It's got a lower um, risk tolerance for being mixed with alcohol. Like there's so much. <laughs> it's just insane how much there is to keep track of. Um, and I'll just throw one last note in before I keep running my mouth about how there are a few um, synthetic cathinones that have appeared on the market recently that are floating around. Um, I believe the dimethyl pentalone is one of the most recent ones, as well as butylone and eutalone. So those three I'm keeping an eye on, but there's no confirmatory testing in the field. So get fucked. Sorry, Provision. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. Um, 20%. I mean, that's scarily high, I would say. Um, ballpark, but that's, ballpark. Keep in yeah. mind, this, I just want to put in the disclaimer that this is like <laughs> just based on we scrap these things together from what we can. And it's also very regionally based and the audience will change that. There's selection bias there of who's willing mm -hmm. to come with it yeah, all. That's true. So there's a lot to consider with that, that statistics in this field are very dangerous to play with, I would say. Yeah. No, that's an interesting point. And I'm glad you said that because I could see people who are coming to you are people buying drugs, maybe in a riskier environment or, you know, if they just bought it at the porta potty, like I'm glad they're coming to you, <laughs> but I'm sure not all of them are. So, um, yeah, no, that was really helpful. And I am curious because I know, and maybe you, you do or do not experience this, but like being someone who works in this field, you know, family, friends with concerns about, you know, what we do for a living. Um, fentanyl is definitely something that I think there's just so many myths around. And I, I kind of just wanted to ask if you, it's an opportunity for some myth busting around fentanyl. If you have myth busting. Awesome. Like, sh let me know what you got. <laughs> okay. So I'll start with one that um, is just so critical to understand, which is that the whole um, transdermal fentanyl absorption and cop overdose things, there have been, there's so much scientific literature about the, feasible likelihood of you being able to not only absorb certain drugs in certain ways, but also have a physiological effect from a substantial enough amount of that drug being absorbed in a way that is biologically possible. So for instance, we've had people, someone shook my hand on GHB and I was dosed, which is just like, phys that's a physical, I can't say impossibility because the reality is that it, it saying hard words like that in drugs is always dangerous because maybe we're idiots, but um, with things like fentanyl, the cop overdose videos have symptoms that don't match opioid overdose. They have onset times that aren't realistic to the root of administration. There's so many contraindications in what you're looking at there. And there was this really interesting journal that was published, I can send you the link to, of a person that works in healthcare who spilled an entire vial of liquid fentanyl on his ungloved hand with a cut on it and just washed it off and went about his merry way and published an article on it being like, you guys are completely and totally misrepresenting the situation. Um, people that work in healthcare handle fentanyl without major precautions all the time. Um, and the reality is that there are certain conditions that need to be satisfied for a substance to be absorbed transdermally. There's a reason why millions of dollars were funded into creating transdermal patches for fentanyl and other substances. So that's the biggest one is I want to put that to rest, that you're not going to overdose on fentanyl by touching it and that you're not going to overdose on fentanyl by being around it. And I also want to bring up the major, major thing to understand about the op opioid overdose triad, which is the three major symptoms of opioid overdose are um, very, very slow, shallow, and or stopped breathing, um, absent or lost, con sorry, reduced or absent consciousness, and pinpoint slash constricted pupils. And I want everyone to understand that the cause of opioid overdose is when your respiration, your breathing slows to the point that your tissues are not being oxygenated and perfused and your heart stops. So that is the sequence, is the signals that your brain is receiving to breathe are dampened to the point where you're not getting enough oxygen. And then because of that, you eventually go into cardiac arrest. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff to that too. Like there's always more to it. But 
if people understood that this is about a lack of oxygen because your breathing is too slow, I think that the public understanding of fentanyl overdose and opioid overdose would change a lot because that in and of itself gives you a lot of information when you're looking at someone and evaluating if an opioid could be involved. Um, There have been a lot of major production companies that have started conflating harm reduction with fentanyl test strips and or naloxone. That's fine and great and everything, but the problem is that there have been probably thousands at this point of people who have just been like, oh my god, mysterious, my body, I Narcan, it was an opioid because I feel better after having getting Narcan. I think that there's a real fine line to tread with this because we don't want to discourage people from taking adequate public health measures and understand that if you're not sure, you can give someone naloxone, it's not going to hurt them. If someone is a chronic pain patient, however, and takes opioids for pain control, that it could make them extremely uncomfortable or sick. Um, but ultimately, it is this is a, a thing where it is better safe than sorry in terms of a lay person who really doesn't know. However, on the flip side of that, we need to be really careful in the messaging in response to that because there have been so many cases of people that have administered naloxone when it was absolutely not indicated, like no need for it whatsoever, freaked out, doxed their dealer on Twitter, um, tried to get kick- someone kicked out of an event, an event or arrested, um, exiled people from their friend groups, and then using um, non-dance safe fentanyl test strips that are not diluted properly and can have a false positive with MDMA or meth. And then that further confirms because they didn't dilute correctly. It's this kind of surprisingly insidious public health implication that is a snowball effect of people really not understanding what opioid overdose is and therefore misattributing things to opioid overdose and therefore traumatizing the person who now believes that they incurred an opioid overdose and then re-ingraining like this is what this looks like and then people experience symptoms of like true panic when they think that there might have been fentanyl in their drugs even when it's statistically very unlikely for certain things um or just is like outright not matching so you can kind of see how this gets to be super convoluted the baseline of this segment is that the primary cause of opioid overdose and the the cause of death is from hypoxia, lacks of o- lack of oxygenation. So in overdose um, response teams or in supervised consumption sites, most of the time naloxone or Narcan isn't even used. They just bag someone and, and assist their ventilations because the idea is to get them oxygenated. And oftentimes fentanyl has a fairly short duration. So someone will frequently only need to be bagged for like 20 minutes, just like giving them breaths and they'll come out of it. If someone is um, overdosing on an opioid who has a physical dependence and a tolerance on opioids, then having too much naloxone administered could send them into precipitated withdrawal. Again, this gets complicated because we think more is less is more is more and better safe than sorry. If you know or suspect that someone has a physical dependence on opioids, you should be giving them the minimum amount of naloxone required to stabilize their breathing. They don't have to wake up. So there are a bunch of schools of this, basically. Number one, you're trying to stabilize their breathing. You want it to be around like 10 or more breaths per minute, hopefully 12 or more. Um, number two, if someone has a known or suspected physical tolerance to opioids, it is extra important to, to the best of your ability, you really only need to give them enough for their breathing to stabilize. Number three, it's going to often take two to three full minutes for naloxone to start working. Um, those will be the longest two to three minutes of your life. And it can be really tempted to just hit someone with a bunch of different doses. Um, If you know that someone does not have a physical tolerance to opioids, then it is a much lower risk operation to give them additional doses. But another issue we're seeing is everyone coming out being like, this overdose was naloxone resistant without additional information. How long did you wait between doses? Um, what specifically were the symptoms and the timeline that occurred for this person before you administered naloxone? How did you administer it? Was there anything in their nose? For instance, if you did it intranasally, had they been snorting something? Could it have been blocked? Um, But also important to note is that there are lots of other reasons why someone might not be as unsedated as you would expect after you give them naloxone. One of them regionally could be xylazine, which I can cover (laughs) if you would like, um, which is a very sedating substance. And there's the jury is still out on whether xylazine causes respiratory depression of its own volition as from a neurological mechanism, or if it is more about the profound sedation of it, causing people to kind of like slump over and close off their own airway manually. 
Then there's also things like diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, can make you really drowsy. Um, or there are benzos in the dope supply in some area or people that use benzos and opioids concomitantly, which can increase the sedation and make it harder for someone to fully wake up. And the problem is that EMS has no way of confirming which of these things is the case. Is someone's opi opioid overdose truly naloxone resistant and need a higher dose? Or could it be related to one of the adulterants that I mentioned or something else entirely um, could it be that this is uh, an even more potent opioid, like something in the, in the nitazine or nitazine family? I still have no idea how to pronounce that. Um, so th there are a bunch of confounding factors there to consider. But my baseline with this is if you come across someone and you think that they might be overdosing on an opioid, you're looking for their breathing. If their breathing is really, really slow, like probably less than 10 breaths, but I would say mostly like eight breaths a minute because some athletes will breathe slower. People with various physical health conditions might breathe faster or slower. Um, if their breathing is slow, if they are not conscious or if they're barely conscious, um, you're really paying attention to their breathing. Um, you can give them naloxone if you have it. If you are able to give rescue breaths in some capacity, you can do that. Um, if you don't have naloxone and you're trained to give your rescue breaths via CPR barrier, that might be a good move, but that's also complex because laypersons often do that wrong. Um, and then if someone truly doesn't have a pulse, then you start CPR on them. Um, but first, always call for medics. And that is my, surprisingly, that is the, actually, that is the truncated version of this rant. <laughs> no, that's, it's a lot. I have questions. <laughs> um... <laughs> but no, th thank you. I think it's really important. And there's just so much misinformation, which is so fascinating because, you know, we're in an opioid epidemic and more people are dying of overdoses than ever before. But yet nobody really knows like why. <laughs> and um, I'm curious. I don't know if you know the answer to this or if this is, you know, known information. But um, when people who like die, you know, I think we've all know people who've died from an overdose. That's kind of all you hear, right? Their families don't want to share more. They don't even maybe know more. I'm curious if people, if you know, like, is it ever found out when people are killed, like what actually killed them? Like are, are there common, you know, that's why I kind of, this started talking about fentanyl. Like is fentanyl the, the, the reason behind overdose deaths or are you saying absolutely not it's that's that's one of these myths is there's so many oh, no. other so there is definitely substantial fentanyl involvement in the deaths that are taking place right now like that is not a myth um there is however complexity in actually quantifying that involvement because <sighs> so many cans of worms in this nothing is ever simple like i can't just say a statement there's so many more statements well, where we have time <laughs> <laughs> so um i'm not a toxicologist and i am fortunate enough to be in a network of many people who are specialized in shit that i'm not so i've been asking toxicologists recently for information about autopsies toxicological screenings and panels and testing and um what i learned is that when autopsy reports are run, they are run to detect a certain panel of the substances that are deemed to be most likely to be involved as far as my understanding goes. So for instance, um, in certain regions where there isn't as enough money for the public health department, um, there might not be enough money to screen for the involvement of xylazine, for instance, in a death. And then when you get past that and you actually have conducted this screening of like a, a subset of substances that were involved in this death, I hope no one like murders me for this being incorrect information. This is, you know, paraphrasing from a toxicologist that I've spoken to. Um, the results of the autopsy report will so often show like the substances that were involved in the nanograms per milliliter, I believe is the measurement. And so like the blood concentration. Um, and then from there, there can be an extrapolation about the specific mechanical cause of death, like what actually caused this person to die. So that gets messy because a lot of the time when we're looking at the reports of deaths related to one thing or another, there are multiple substances involved. 
and potentially prior health conditions involved and potentially additional environmental complications involved. So it can be really difficult to tease apart the specifics unless you actually had a witness there to explain the context of the situation. So for instance, if someone overdosed on fentanyl, that is a fairly straightforward one, I would say, is like a hypoxic drive, like you have, um, that's not the correct phrase for that, someone becomes hypoxic, they don't have enough um, oxygenation to their tissues, and eventually after some time, including the heart, and that's a big deal, um, and the brain, and after I think it's like four or five minutes or so, you start experiencing cell death in those regions. So that is usually a thing that can be extrapolated if like explicitly a bag that contained fentanyl was found on this person's body or um, if the autopsy report showed, for instance, fentanyl and 4-ANPP, which is frequently found alongside fentanyl as part of the manufacturing process, as well as like diphenhydramine, as well as whatever else is commonly found in that bag. So you can kind of get a picture of it from there. Um, people do sometimes DM Dansafe autopsy reports that I will kind of walk through with them to the best of my ability, which is really rough. Um, it's really fucking hard. There are so many people that have been in our DMs with this stuff recently saying, I don't know where to get information about these drugs. Like, I don't know what this drug is. Can you help me? I just want answers. I want closure. Um, so it really, it can be more complicated sometimes. For instance, if someone was doing a speedball of uh, cocaine and there was fentanyl as well or something like that or another opioid, um, it's totally possible that the cause of death was not in fact from opioid overdose, but was instead from like an acute cardiac event because cocaine has a higher incidence rate of cardiac events than most other popularly used stimulants. So if someone had a pre-existing like heart defect or heart condition or arrhythmia, it could be that. It could be an electrical disruption. It could be someone that had a, sustained a prolonged seizure from overamping on meth and the prolonged seizure caused cell death and whatever. Like there's so many different explanations and ultimately, I think that probably the most helpful thing, if you can get the big three, I would say you get the most information. Um, someone that was there in the room that can explain exactly what they witnessed and the symptoms of the other person. Uh, the actual substances that were consumed that can be tested via a lab, like drugs data for GCMS analysis or forensic toxicology, whatever, as well as an autopsy report. If you can get all three of those, then you can get a really clear picture of what happened to someone. Wow. So in terms of um, substances that, you know, you mentioned the big five that Dance Safe is typically encountering at music festivals and give or take 20-ish percent of, you know, <laughs> you said it was like not expected results, I think is what you said. So yeah. what um, you're so you're not finding what is wrong necessarily, but are, are you testing for fentanyl typically at, in that situation? Or I guess when have you found f fentanyl? So we do not test for patrons at events. We provide the strips for patrons to use themselves. And there are a number of really good reasons for that. We're working on finding a way to make it more accessible for patrons to use the strips themselves. Um, it's kind of like a teach a man to fish kind of vibe, I would yeah, say. Totally. <laughs> um, but also it's a fickle process. Fentanyl strip testing requires precision. There is a lot of, there's a lot more to it than people realize just like with reagents. Like there's so many things to know. It's my job to hunt these things down. And every, I say this all the time and I am not exaggerating, like probably every three to five days I learned that I was wrong about something. Like it is that frequent. And I've been testing with reagents for about 10 years. So that's, uh, that's a really limiting factor, I would say, in how much direct data we have about the presence of fentanyl at events and in substances that people are typically getting tested by DanceSafe. And there are a few complexities to this. Uh, surprise. One of them is when there's a, a high degree of user error with the strips, um, for us to have a fentanyl positive that we consider to be a valid positive worth investigating, um, in non-opioid drugs, so drugs where it's less likely for it to be present because it is very, very heavily involved in opioid-like substances, but different degrees of prevalence in non-opioid drugs. Um, if we get a suspected true positive, we would have to verify exactly how someone used the strips, confirm that the strips are not expired and that they use them with the right amount of water and that they actually used a scale or measuring tools and that they, yada, yada. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that has to go into it. 
And then from there with fentanyl test strips, there is um, diphenhydramine Benadryl is known to throw false positives with all of the fentanyl test strips on the market, as far as I'm aware. So um, we try to get that sample sent to drugs data for further evaluation um, to make sure that there isn't an additional cut that could be interfering with the result and causing a false positive. And then there's another layer to that too, which is the chocolate chip cookie effect where fentanyl can, is usually or always unevenly distributed around a bag because it's active in such small quantities. The best practice that we found is to crush the material and shake it, like seriously shake it very vigorously for a really long time to redistribute as well as you can. So then if someone does that and we send it into drugs data to reduce the likelihood of drugs data missing it, and we come back with, like, there are multiple steps for us to be like, okay, this is a non-opioid substance or a surprise presence of fentanyl in this substance. And because there's so much misunderstanding, we're trying to go through all those steps so that when we get that information, we can be like, okay, this is as close as we can get to confirming this. And that obviously is almost always not possible. So right now, um, having spoken to um, labs around the country, I am personally only aware of probably less than five cases of trace amounts of fentanyl being contaminating a bag of ketamine or a bag of MDMA around the country. Um, that is all that I'm aware of in terms of those two substances. There are obviously going to be lots and lots of claims to the contrary, and the issue is, do we have the symptom timelines, the specific, do we have bystanders who witnessed this event? Like, what did this person experience? What happened that made them think there was an opioid involved? What specific test strip did they use? How did they dilute the test strip? All these different things. So people have these very ingrained understandings of the different substances that they've taken. And some of them might be right. Like it's possible that we don't know the prevalence of fentanyl in some of these substances like ketamine, for instance. Maybe it is there in ways that we haven't been able to catch. But every case that I have personally chased down of trying to get that information has ended up with a dead end or someone sharing information that directly contradicted the likelihood of it being there. So that makes it really fucking difficult. In terms of cocaine, that's a, that's one where I would say that the likelihood of fentanyl contaminating cocaine is significantly higher than any other recreational, that's not the word I want to use, any other substance that is commonly utilized, um, that is commonly tested at the Dance Safe booth. Because mark my words, people do use um, opioids and other drugs that are less socially accepted at festivals too. They're just probably less likely to talk to you about it because you'll stigmatize them. So just keep that in mind. So there's that component of things. And then um, there are other complications around this. I need to stop saying that phrase because it's too applicable. And also I'm repeating myself, but um, there are other things to consider. So like, was something sold to someone as a speedball? Was this sold by someone that is known to supply opioids to the community? And therefore there could be a higher risk of cross-contamination. So for instance, um, there was an experiment where someone I know was like, I think that you are underestimating the prevalence of cocaine that is contaminated with fentanyl. They went out in Denver, they bought three different grams of coke from three different seedy dudes on the street, came back, did the entire testing process completely perfectly using the dance safe test strips, and one of the three came back positive. We are waiting on lab results to confirm that. So the truth is, I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows for sure. So there's a lot of um, confounding variables that are easy to forget about when we're considering what we're looking at with this data. Yeah, that's, that's, inc I mean, that's scary and incredible. And I'm curious to see where those results, you know, how they come back. Because I think, you know, what's interesting is hearing you talk about, you know, the complexities of testing and leaving it up to the consumer, um, you know, to be the one to kind of figure it out. I mean, right. It's, it's like the same thing with, consumers I mean it's different but like being responsible for recycling it's like we need companies corporations to take action or like to be more responsible and so it's like I would think is there any part of your work Dan Saves work that's like trying to get to the bigger like producers or the sources is that even 
possible. Like I just, it seems a little daunting that, you know, this is in the hand of the consumer and it's like, are they really going to take these measures to test? And obviously you being there in person is amazing, but people do drugs at nightclubs and all over the place. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how do we, how do we actually educate people and give them the tools when it seems like it's, it's complicated, like it's really complicated. So it's like, I guess I just, yeah, just a tad. So, I mean, what are, I guess, I don't know. I'm curious where you see like hope or like, just like places where we're like, no, this can really make a difference and not yeah. just in the hands of the consumer. <laughs> um, yes, I do have hope. The needle has been moving for sure. The fact that we are directly permitted in some cases to have advanced drug checking on site at festivals is enormous. And when it comes to supply side, um, there we've had some conversations with some folks who are creating some really amazing materials that are intended to support people who sell drugs and being harm reductionists. Those are, I don't know where those are at, but um, there is attention being paid to that for sure, because there is a lot of power in those communities to engage in harm reduction. However, you also get more unusual cases like in Philly, where pretty much all of the dope supply, the opioid supply, contains xylazine at this point in time. And there is a lot of uncertainty and a lot of misunderstanding around how that ended up happening specifically. And a lot of the conversations that I've been a part of, people have speculated that the xylazine is entering into the supply at the street level. It's not getting cut in on the supply side level, really. It's in the distribution level. So we do have regional issues like that where there is limited ability to condense the education that you're doing because there are so many people that are doing foot traffic with selling drugs. And that can happen elsewhere too. I'd say that the opioid supply is one of the places that is most prone to things like that taking place because opioids are so heavily controlled that that's why fentanyl entered the market in the first place is because it's so much more potent and you can transfer so much less of it for the same amount of profit if you cut and dilute with the with the right stuff. So um, there are certain measures that we can take. However, there's also turf, issues of turf and issues of marketing and issues of branding. And we have to remember that a lot of the time, the root of people that are engaged in the drug trade is poverty. And um, really, if we wanted to address this, we would be providing universal basic income and universal health care and housing and things like that. Whoa, hot takes. Whoa. Yeah. I and I mean, and like, yeah. that, that's what I thought. It's like, oh, wow. How, we, how about we end the drug war and then we can actually have like... <laughs> Uh, a, a website that's like dealers, right. you know, can come on and they're like, I've been approved by Dance Safe. My shit's been tested for like whatever. <laughs> but wow, what a future. <laughs> I know. And it's, it's so wild, right? Like we could actually avoid all of jumping through these hoops if there were broader systemic changes that were made. But all of this has been a Band-Aid since the beginning. Like Dance Safe was founded partially in response to the fact that E-Man, the founder, would go to raves and the Bay Area and ask people what they were taking and they'd be like, I don't know, but sometimes I feel amazing and sometimes I get really sick. And he started testing and um, sending things to labs and found out that there was DXM in the pills and that can create um, hyperthermic crisis for some people like overheating. And so like, yeah, all of this has been done in response to the easy shit not being taken care of, which I mean, easy is it's, easy for me to sit in an armchair and be like, oh, yeah, it'd be so easy. But the reality is that even that is incredibly complex. We can't even get people insulin. Like, how are we supposed to equitably introduce drug markets if we can't even get people basic, I'm going to die tomorrow without this kind of medications, without them losing their house over it? Or like, I don't know, Flint's water crisis that's still going on. Like, We can't treat these things like they're actually easy solutions because none of them are easy solutions. And the unfortunate part is that implementing these structures that were harmful in the first place was so fast comparatively, like implementing the single narcotics convention and the war on drugs and all of these structures that were put into place, the crack house statutes, like these things were put in with so much less effort than it's going to be to dig up the foundation that they've laid. That's a real disaster. (laughs) 
So my hope now is there are definitely ways to reach people on the supply side and attempt to instill these practices and make those connections. And at the same time, it is going to remain the responsibility of the consumer, in my opinion. So the best thing that we can do is we can appeal to that person in the friend group who really gives a shit about this and wants to be the point person. And it's basically we're establishing like captains throughout different yeah. regions. Like that's a big part of why our instructions are so dense is that a lot of people will just skip over them and go to the easy reference guide. But there are going to be those people in the group that read the entire thing and want to sit down and really do it properly. So if we can get that across, then the ripple effect is real. Like we don't want to be the ones hoarding the knowledge around this. The point is to give people the resources based on our most recent findings, which change all the time and our materials have to change all the time because of it. Um, we want other people to be able to take that out into the world themselves. Yeah, I love that. I think that's an amazing point that, you know, it doesn't have to be every single person. Like it's about community, typically, in, especially in, you know, the um, recreational settings and even in ceremonial medical, like not everyone is doing this in a silo. And so um, if we can get someone in a group and what I was going to say, right, as you were saying that is, um, you know, I just want to put a shout out to people out there who are providing drugs to their communities. And like that this you're making money on this. This is providing you potentially, you know, a livelihood like be, you know, do the right thing, like do the work, buy kits like if you're not already doing it, because unfortunately, you know, they're they're not. There are people who aren't, obviously. And it's it's like become that captain. I think that um charge more if you need to you know like whatever you got to do um but i think it, it 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 we have to take responsibility um i i agree as the consumer um but i i love that idea of you know just kind of tapping someone in the community or um but just you know we need to demand that i think also from who we're purchasing substances from and if they say they test it's like awesome can you take a photo or like you know like just hold, try to hold some people accountable um, so yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, I think we definitely covered, you know, I wanted to cover a lot on drug testing. You know, it's a huge part of what you do and it's a huge reason, uh, why, you know, why we're here today. But, um, I really am curious just to know a little bit more about the other services you offer and how you're, you know, benefiting the festival party community. Um, if you want to share more about, I think it was your consent program yeah. or what? Yeah, yeah, please, please share. <laughs> so um, We Love Consent is, it is, I, I love the We Love Consent program. And this is not me tuning my own horn. I barely am involved in it, except for doing like last run edits. Um, this is the uh, brainchild of Chris and Kara, Stacey Forrester, and Sloan Ferenczak. I really hope I pronounced that right. Every time I say it, I, I say, I hope I pronounced that right. And I'm pretty sure I always do. So I'm hoping that this time as well. But the three of them are just incredible badasses. And the We Love Consent program has my favorite consent content of all time in this program called Healing is Power, or it's a campaign called Healing is Power. Um, this is all on our website. And the We Love Consent program is about creating a consent culture in this community. So not just like getting consent, but actually practicing consent as a means of conducting yourself with other people always. In any setting, it's like people associate consent with sex, but it's really about sharing the universe with other living beings. And um, the Healing is Power campaign is all about consent and power dynamics in the music industry. So that includes things like power dynamics between like artist and fan or like people that have different social um, backgrounds or like privileges of being, for instance, like able-bodied or a AMAB or things like that. And considering all of these things in the context of how you can not only identify, but also respond to and mitigate those power dynamics. And it's very action oriented, which I really love because I think a lot of consent material is very theoretical, but healing is power has specific things that you can do in response to these situations, specific things that you do as part of bystander intervention, um, specific tips for actions and behaviors and how to support someone who might've been sexually assaulted um, how to respond if you've been accused of causing harm, which is an amazing article on our website that I really love. Um, just sent it off yesterday to somebody. And 
uh, so the Wheel of Consent program is um, currently fleshing out its kind of like outreach materials toolbox. There's going to be a lot more Wheel of Consent stuff on the tables in the coming years. But that is also baked into our new training program that we just released is like mandatory consent training for volunteers as well. That's incredible. And it's actually something that I have been um, just like exploring within myself recently. A girlfriend told me that um, I, I love this. She was she works with children and I, I think she read an article about how we need to be like asking children consent to tickle them. Yes. Um, yes. Like pr- before they can speak even like that these doing things, you know, when people cannot consent, um, even as simple as tickling, like, can cause trauma if they don't, you know, aren't wanting that. And, uh, yeah, and I thought that was such a powerful and, and beautiful thing, like, we don't think about. Um, and, yeah, it, it's it doesn't – yes, of course, in sexual situations, consent is so important. And um, But to your point of it's not only um, – you know, sometimes I don't even want to handshake people. Like, it's just yeah. like I don't yeah. – don't touch me, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. and, I, and I've been coming, becoming a lot more confident in my power and with my voice. And even, like, through psychedelic therapy, feeling more comfortable to have those boundaries. Um, so that's amazing. So is that part of – it, it's is it free to the public is it a something oh, yeah. that okay amazing yeah. it's like an online course well the campaign itself just includes materials that are on our website oh. so um like graphics and slides and animations and um additional links out to more content and videos and interactive stuff and then the stuff that's like all the front-facing services that we offer there are only a few things that are not free at dance safe and that's drug checking materials and um high fidelity earplugs and if we have like merch those are the only ones i can think of off the top of my head but other than that it's like if you love what we're doing and you want to throw in a donation to help us keep doing it you can do that but you're not going to get turned away of course um and there yeah there's there's more on that but yeah cool yeah well it's dancesafe.org is that perfect um yeah, and you kind of led me to my next question, you know, on just any other resources that you recommend for people. I mean, it sounds like you have a ton on your website, but are there any additional resources that you use yeah. or love? <laughs> yes. Um, my favorite website about drugs at this moment and has been for a few years is psychonotwiki.org. That website is amazing. It has recommended dosage tiers for various substances, for various routes of administration. It has a lot of citation, which is really good, so you can paper trail it. Um, has a lot of information about um, additional things like subjective effects. And then on that note, there's also, let me make sure I get this right, it's effectindex.com. Effectindex.com is so sick. It is basically a wiki library that details the specific effects of a drug experience in words and gives names and like visual imagery to it. And that can be really helpful, I think, for integration purposes. If someone is like, I just had this insane experience and I don't know how to put it into words and it was so complicated and no one will ever understand me. And you can go to Effect Index and kind of peruse the different effects that have been uploaded. Um, Like I said, a lot of them include visual aids to help you get a feel for what they might look like in practice. Like um, people have created GIFs of tracers and things like that. And um, what else? Drugs data, of course. Drugsdata.org is the most outstanding front-facing public library of advanced drug checking results that I'm aware of. There's also, um, I think it's streetsafe.supply is the drug checking program for University of North Carolina. And that has a lot of front facing drug checking results from them too, which is super helpful. If you want to get quant analysis, so an actual quantification of how much is in a substance or a pill, you can send a sample to Energy Control in Spain. Um, And I think that those those are some of the main ones I would say. There are obviously a lot more. Cool. Yeah, we'll we'll put them in the show notes so that our listeners can check them out. Um, is there anything else? I guess any last minute tips you'd want to share with with our um, our community before we go? Ah, <laughs> uh, there is so much to say at all times. Honestly, um, I would just give a reminder always, which is to 
always communicate the limitations of what you know, assume that you are missing information because you are, and when you are reporting on something that you witnessed, share only what you saw and what you did, including timelines. This is a major, major note for anybody, including people who work in EMS, especially people who work in EMS, because Um, There have been a lot of very well-intentioned folks who have ended up spreading misinformation like wildfire by saying things as certainties instead of sharing observations and either speculation that is designated as a speculation or just saying this is what I saw and what I did because then someone who has more specialization in that particular thing can step in and evaluate what the possible cause and effect of what you saw and what you did might have been. So for instance, someone runs up to me while I'm like working at an event, I need Narcan, my friend needs Narcan. And their friend comes in tripping balls and like windmilling. And if someone had said like, if that same person had gone to their friends and been like, yeah, I needed to get Narcan for him. Like I had to, I had to Narcan him. Um, That just totally misrepresents what just happened there. And instead of saying, yeah, like he was, windmilling and his pupils were dilated and I didn't know what to do and I asked for Narcan. That gives someone who has more specialty in the topic the ability to step in and say, it's awesome that you tried to find help for your friend. What you're talking about doesn't sound like it matches an opioid overdose, so naloxone wouldn't have been helpful. But what you're talking about does sound like someone that was having maybe a really intense experience on a substance. So maybe you can have a conversation with them about what that experience was like and talk about the next time. Um, And it's the same with any sort of medical thing on the road, like it's yeah cops no, and medics <laughs> are not equipped to tell you confirmatory information about what drugs were and were not involved unless they say it was tested via this laboratory and this lab or via this piece of equipment that was like hidden back away in the back like if it wasn't tested by something then it's not confirmatory information it's all educated speculation with varying degrees of confidence depending on how much someone knows Thank you. And before we go, I meant to actually ask this earlier. Um, as I, I told you before we hopped on here, you know, I'm I'm new to this space. And um, to be honest, I don't know. Like, how does Narcan work when mm-hmm. someone is going through an overdose? So like, I wanted to touch on that. So the simple explanation is that um, opioids exist naturally in your body, endogenous opioids, things like endorphins are opioids. And they function by fitting themselves into these little receptors in your cells. And so they stick themselves in there and something happens. For some neurotransmitters or some substances in your body, that means that something stops happening or it means that something continues happening. Um, Basically, it's this really, it's like binary code almost. Like all the signals in your brain are happening, yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. It's the speed and the location of that happening that really dictates the end result. So... With opioid overdose, there are a lot of opioids occupying a lot of particular receptors, and naloxone is an opioid antagonist a specific, at specific receptors. So it chooses particular receptors, it goes in there, and it's like, get out, and knocks an opioid out of the Got receptor it. and sticks itself in there. So that will lift the opioids out of the receptors and reverse the respiratory depression effects that they're exerting. That is a thousand mile view yeah. again for anyone in the medical profession <laughs> is like this is as simple as I can make it. No, um, I, I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> so people people don't understand that it's not like a stimulant, for instance. It's not just making your heart beat faster so you wake up. It's it's specifically knocking opioids out of the receptors. It's very targeted. So it's not going to do anything for anything except opioid overdose. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much um, for your time. I learned a lot and I know that our listeners did too. Um, So this was Rachel Clark from Dance Safe and everyone check out dancesafe.org and we'll see you next time. Thanks for having me. 